Please will you turn in your Bibles to Philippians chapter 4. For those that are visiting, we are um, doing a series on Genesis, but with uh, some matters in the life of the church and my own going away on leave. I've broken away from it for a short period and will be returning to it when I come back. My colleagues are working through the book of Mark. So this morning, just a one-off message from this passage in Philippians. Can I just confirm if I'm coming through loud enough at the back? I, I feel a little bit quieter than normal. Maybe that's a good thing. <laughs> All right. Um, this, this passage is well known. It's beloved to many, including myself. It's one that I return to often and frequently use in ministering to others. And yet it's not one that I've preached on for uh, probably about 16 years since the previous church I was at, and I'd like to return to it now. I'm going to read from the middle of verse 5, where it begins by saying, The Lord is at hand, and down to verse 9. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there's anything worthy of praise, think about these things. What you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, familiar words indeed, but words that are timeless and are a gift to the church. Make them to be a blessing to your people this morning, I ask for Jesus' sake. Amen. I've opened and I've read to you from the Word of God, and it is a word for Christians. This passage is not for those who are here, those of you who are not followers of the Lord Jesus Christ, who are strangers to God, who are condemned in your sins. It's not for you. And in fact, I have no interest in trying to help the unbeliever not to be anxious, not to worry. I have no interest at all. It's a fool's errand. There's no basis for you not to be worried. There's no power for you to conquer your fears. Indeed, I would say to you that peace is the privilege of the Christian. So if you're not a Christian, let me say to you, be anxious. Be alarmed. Be in terror. For the days of your life are fleeting, and the terrible, terrible judgment of God is to come when there is no peace. You, you might feel okay. You might be numbed by the world around you, but your feelings are like the feelings of a passed-out drunk locked in his cabin on a sinking ship, and the wrath of God is coming. Be anxious. Be alarmed. Be in terror. Be afraid if you are not a Christian. And let it fill your heart and your mind and your life until you turn to God in repentance. And if you will do that, if you will confess the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior and mighty God, trusting in His death on the cross and His resurrection and putting all of your hope in Him, repenting of your evils, then the words of Philippians 4 may be applied to you liberally and joyfully and with a free conscience, because it is talking to Christians. I want that to be very clear from the onset. But to the many here who are Christians, now we look at the text. I pray that we will leave this morning with a deep conviction of the power of God to subdue our anxieties and the unbelieving nature of our flesh. I remind you what Paul said to Timothy, God gave us a spirit not of fear, but of power and love 
and a sound mind, as the old King James puts it, self-control in the ESV. The Spirit of God can soothe and heal and strengthen the hearts and minds of His people to make us to think clearly and feel correctly by His great power. So let me break down this text. I begin with a point that is more contextual. It is simply this. What vexes thee? What vexes thee? Potential causes of anxiety in the context of Philippians. And I I phrase the question like that in that very old style, instead of just saying, what are you worried about? Because that old word vex almost seems to have a malicious quality to it, doesn't it? To, To vex someone is to harass them, to distress or annoy them with something, to to agitate, to cause them to be uh, worrying and anxious. I I, I always thought it sounded a bit like the word hex, meaning to bewitch or to curse someone. Uh, It's a completely different word. As far as I know, there's no similarity in origin. Uh, But sometimes to be vexed feels like you are hexed. (laughs) There's alarming, distracting, relentless thoughts that creep upon a person to draw our minds away from the rock that is Christ Jesus. Things that erode and eat at peace and joy and make us quite contradictory creatures. We know, we love, we believe the truth, yet we are vexed into a state of fear and anxiety, sometimes by our flesh and sometimes by the fiery darts of the evil one. So what what vexes you this morning, I wonder? Allow me to suggest to you some of the things that might have worried the Philippian church based on the comments in this letter. For starters, the one writing it, Paul, the apostle of Jesus Christ, their father in in the faith in so many ways, is in prison, in danger. And the the thoughts in their minds must have been a plenty. Uh, Why is this happening? What, What about his work? What about his labors? How will the church survive if yet another apostle is taken? Those sorts of fears about the future absence of someone, which are sometimes shared in our own time, uh, worry about the death of a loved one, a spouse, a beloved spouse, worried about the resignation of a key employee, worried about the passing of a competent and faithful generation in the church, worried about the scarcity of Christian men or women of meritable age, points of anxiety. Then we see in Philippians 1, 28 to 29, that the Philippians were frightened of their opponents. They expected to suffer for the sake of the gospel. That, that can be alarming as well, can't it, even today? Enemies of the gospel, or just enemies generally, personal enemies, rising up, intimidating, threatening, seeming so strong and sure of themselves. And, and how will you stand against them? especially if they wield the, wield the power of the tyrannical state, the beast of revelation, when the, the tides of politics turn towards uh, Marxism or liberalism and the thought police stamp their hooves and snort at the church and free speech is under fire and autocratic laws begin to clamp down on the freedoms that we take for granted, as is, as is happening in, in the Christian West even, so-called Christian. It, it can be frightening. Then in two, chapter 226, it seems the Philippians also had concerns about health issues. In that instance, the health of Paul's co-worker, Ephroditus, um, and, and with him in turn being concerned that they were worried about him. But, but it's an instinctive human thing to have a concern for one's body or a concern for the health of a loved one. The fear that something is wrong or might be wrong, or what comes next if it turns out that it is indeed a real issue. A fear that is only compounded, anxieties that only grow by the costs of the treatment, or by the uncertainty of waiting, the fear of pain, the fear of loss, loss of mobility, loss loss of functionality, loss even of life. Paul also notes his own anxiety in Uh, verse 28 of of, of that same chapter. Not a sinful sort of anxiety there, though, but he has a spiritual concern to see the Philippians established more firmly in the faith, to to see them mature and grow in grace. Uh, we, We share that anxiety, don't we? We have a concern for our children, for their spiritual future. Will they remember the biblical counsel of their youth? 
which is able to make them wise unto salvation. Then in chapter 4, verse 2, there's mention of a disagreement between two women in the church there at Philippi, Euodia and Syntyche. Uh, that sort of interpersonal tension. How will they react? Uh, what will they say? What will happen when next I must see them or work with them? The conflict in the congregation, the workplace, the school, the church, a family, uh, it can lead to vexing anxiety. And perhaps one more example from chapter 4, verses 10 to 14, where Paul speaks of the concern that the Philipp Philippians had for him. A, a, a loving concern, not one that he rebukes, but actually one that he commends. There are such things as legitimate concerns that are not sinful. Buddy balcom has got an excellent message on that, by the way. But sometimes unbelief tries to masquerade as a legitimate and lawful concern. For example, you, you walk with a child next to a busy road. You, you have a lawful, uh, a natural concern to keep the child safe from danger. You, you generates alertness on your part. Will the kid bolt? You, you hold their hand that little bit more tightly because you have a natural concern for their safety. But if your heart and mind is consumed by fears of disaster, every step you take, making you want to retreat from everything to avoid all risk, to perfectly control your surroundings, then you have a sinful unbelief instead of a legitimate concern. You're not trusting God's goodness and wisdom and power. And what type of concern does, does, is there in chapter 4, verse 10 following? It's a, it's a lawful concern, a natural concern for the well-being of Paul, a, a beloved brother. But Paul takes the opportunity to speak about contentment in other things. Because very often... Those other things become a source of anxiety. Worry about money. Worry about bills. Worry about where one will live. Or as Jesus said, what you will eat or drink or put on. The basic necessities of life. So, so these, these are the sorts of things that may vex the Christian soul. And are probably in the apostle's mind as he introduces the words of comfort that now follow. Brings us to the second point. The Lord is at hand. Second part of verse 5. Also translated, the Lord is near. Uh, the word can mean either near in presence or near in time. Both are true. Of course, the Lord is near in both ways. Uh, and we are to live with an expectation of the imminent return of Christ. But that doesn't seem to be the emphasis now in verse 5. Rather, his emphasis is on the nearness in proximity, the nearness of God to us literally which is why it's translated here as the Lord is at hand. Do you think of God's presence in that way, anxious Christian? He's not far away, requiring you to go out and look for Him. No, He's always at your side. He's always at hand. And though we seek Him, we seek to know in Him and grow in Him and and grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ, absolutely, He is not far away. If you will permit me this liberty, I will say that the hand of the compassionate Savior is always on your shoulder when they sag at the onset of some fresh new calamity, when something lands heavily in your life to cause you distress. The consuming, immersive immensity of God's infinite and invisible Spirit surrounds you. Not only then, but constantly. In Him we live and move and have our being. The living, powerful, personal presence of the divine being is in your most immediate vicinity always, even within His people. And that is a very comforting thought for the troubled Christian. We often speak of taking our concerns to the Lord, as well we should, as we make efforts to pray, and we'll see that in the next point. We imagine ourselves packaging our thoughts and our concerns, our confessions and our requests, and we, when we've gathered them, we sort of carry them into the throne room of grace, and we petition the King of the universe, and in a sense, that's exactly what we are doing. But we must never think in terms of Him needing to be informed of, of having to, to rise off the throne and come near to us, and that only when we bid him come that does, that, is, he, is he around. 
Now, we must embrace the mystery of Trinitarian comfort that God is everywhere, and yet He is also holy and fully present wherever I am. There's not some fractional percentage of God that is with us this morning in this room. Not no point, no, 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 one, because the rest of it is scattered amongst the other churches. No, the wholeness, the fullness of the divine being is everywhere, always. Seeing, knowing, interceding for His people, sustaining them, strengthening by His Word. And there's not one thing that surprises him. There's not one sheep, not the smallest Christian child who is apart from him, not even for a fraction of a second. The Lord is near. The Lord is at hand. Practice this knowledge. Tell it to yourself often. Practice the presence of God. I've even heard of a church leadership that when they have their meetings, they would always put out one extra chair. If there were 10 men there, they would put 11th chair out. Not, not expecting God to materialize, not meaning that He was confined to that chair, not as some sort of gimmick, but just to remind themselves that they met in the presence of Christ. And that empty chair would loom large in their presence if, if ever the meeting got a little bit tense or there was disagreement about something. Brothers and sisters, remind yourself daily minutely, if you must, that God is experientially, supernaturally, invisibly at your side, at hand. Which brings us to the next point. Do not be anxious, but in everything, pray. We must be very careful to acknowledge the source of verse 6. Yes, it's Paul writing to us, but if it's just Paul, then woe to us. What comfort would that be for us this morning? That you must see the Spirit of Christ behind these words of comfort. You must remember that they are spoken by one whose love for the believer is infallible and proven countless times over, supremely in the cross. You must remind yourself that the words, do not be anxious, are spoken to you by the King of kings, the one who holds infinite cosmic power in his hands, the one who knows and plans the future down to the falling of every single sparrow from the sky. You must remember his goodness, his moral perfections, the, the wisdom with which he arranges every part of his creation. Remember what he said to Job, can you lead forth? Orion, the Pleiades, the, the Maseroth, the bear across the sky, these star formations. Can you do that? No, I can't. He is the one who bids you to come to Him, though. Bids you not to be anxious. The one who encoded your very DNA. The one who strikes dead in a moment the enemies of the church and brings them before His judgment seat who turns the hearts of kings and overthrows whole empires. And He cares for you, Christian. You are His friend, though you are His servant. So do not think that the words, do not be anxious, are like those, those empty um, platitudes that fill fridge magnets or Greetings cards saying things like, good luck, what, 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 what help is that? You might as well say, grow a third arm or learn to fly or harvest money off trees. There are words without authority. They are vain, meaningless, empty words. A waste of ink, a waste of breath. But when the Lord of hosts who commands myriads of angels and shakes the earth by His voice, when He says, do not be anxious, that's something worth holding on to. And it's so personal, isn't it? It, it speaks to the knowledge of God, this intimate knowledge of His people, because we do grow anxious, don't we? That's why the Bible speaks about it so often. Jesus says to His disciples, do not be anxious. Why? Because it's never a temptation for us. Never, never at all. No, because it will always be a temptation for His people. 
But he comes with words of understanding, words of sympathy to his tiny, perplexed little creatures that are prone to wander, prone to grow astray, go astray. Uh, it's like those other words that are often spoken by God or his messengers, the angels, uh, and I love to hear them every time they come up in Holy Scripture. The words, do not be afraid. Don't you love it when you read that in the Bible? Do not be afraid to the disciples on the boat, to the woman at the empty tomb, to John and his visions of glory, to trembling, frightening Christians. Do not be afraid. And you love to hear them, not only because it's telling you, do not be afraid, because it tells you he knows me. He knows me. He knows what I'm like. And now he says, do not be anxious about anything. Anything. Not, not do not be anxious about anything except the following pre approved areas of anxiety where you may carry on. Not as one psychologist suggests, do not be anxious except for 15 minutes a day wherein you let yourself worry as much as you like and then you stop afterwards and you, you've said, I've worried enough for today. No. Blind guides, knowing nothing of the power of sin or the power of the Spirit to conquer it. No, he says, do not be anxious about anything, anything. And of course, I, I won't pretend that's always easy. But there are multitudes, there are legions of things that tempt us towards anxiety, that tempt us towards unbelief, tempt us to think less of Scripture's promises than we are meant to. Uh, they, they rise up, don't they, like the uh, the, the heads of the mythical beast, the, the hydra. Kids, you might have seen this in, in some ancient stories. Uh, this monster with multiple necks and heads coming out of it. And every time one is cut off, another one rises again and again and again and again. That's what happens. The fears, they rise up one after the next, taking turns. And, and our attention pivots between them, between crime and the neighborhood home invasion, to politics on the land, to health, to finances, to family issues, to church issues, to children issues, to big decisions that need to be made, to exams, to enemies, to the future, and back again. No sooner is one resolved than another head of the hydra rides up and it sways before you with mesmerizing um, complexity like a spitting cobra drawing you in and inviting you to fixate on that thing. Yet today, the Lord God Almighty says to you, do not be anxious about that, or that, or that, or that, or that, or that. Do not be anxious. But verse 5, in everything by prayer, verse 6 rather, in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. So God doesn't just tell his children uh, not to worry. He doesn't just pat us on the head and say, no, no, everything's fine, go off and play. No, he gives us this most practical counsel. Take your concerns to him, take your fears to your heavenly father, cast your anxieties on him because he cares for you, and come with thanksgiving. Come with thanksgiving. And understand that this is biblical prayer now we're talking about. This is not like one of the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous telling you to find some sort of higher power that gives you strength. That's about as pagan an idea as you can get. You once picked your poison, now pick your God to get you out of trouble. This is not lip service. This is not the the secular psychologist treating prayer as mental reconditioning as some sort of coping mechanism. That's not what the apostle is telling us to do. This is not a trick of the mind. No, this is a call to engage, encounter God. This is the blood-bought follower of Christ crying out to an actual living being who is near and at hand and unpacking your heart and your concerns before him, asking, expecting, and seeking light in Scripture. This is thinking, feeling, seeking prayer. It might mean time spent on your knees or flat on your face, lying prostrate on the ground. Nothing like hugging the dirt to remind you 
that you are dust and that God is the eternal spirit. It's not a casual request to help me and then just carrying on. It's, it's a war. It's a, a battling your own fleshly instinct not to trust God in the matter that concerns you. And if you give up this sort of serious praying, you lose the war. You lose the fight. The hydra overwhelms you. You need to be a supplicant, verse 6. You, uh, the word means to entreat. It means to bring a request out of a deep personal need. It means to keep coming. I know some, some teaching has suggested if you're worried about something, you pray once about it, and you never return to that matter, and that to return to the matter would be to demonstrate a lack of faith. I would counsel, though, that Jesus returned to the same matter in Gethsemane three times. And he taught us the parable of the persistent widow, and he taught us the parable of the friend at midnight, both of which called to, uh, for us to come to God regularly in those matters uh, where we have ongoing struggle and temptation and weakness and trial. Now, I don't mean we should obsess in prayer and make prayer to be the cause of distress. I don't mean that the one prone to worry about their health must now morbidly pick at their fear in the place of prayer unpacking all their, their imagined horrors to only create more anxiety. I just mean that as the concern arises, cast them on God with simplicity and honesty and take refuge in His promises. And you go, as I say, verse 6, as it says here, with thanksgiving. For the sake of our soul and for the sake of God's glory, we, we make our prayers with gratefulness. A failure to thank God is ingratitude, it's in it's blindness, it's self-centeredness. So we must acknowledge gratefully the astonishing variety of things He has done. You consciously call them to mind. Everything historically, recently that He has, ha has done, and you, you examine them in the place of prayer, and you thank Him. You don't have to pack, unpack your whole life, no. <laughs> but when anxious, when alarmed, you get down on your knees and you thank Him for His works of creation, His works of salvation, His works of sustaining you, His daily provision, His kindnesses to the world. You go into detail, you think on His promises, you thank Him for them, and in so doing, in fellowship with Him, He helps you. That brings us to the next point if you look at verse 7. Expect the surpassing peace of God in heart and mind. And, and this is the part that ironically becomes a source of distress and controversy. Because many believers will say, but I have prayed and I still battle. This peace has not been my experience. The promise seems to have failed. What am I to do when the very Word of God assures me of something and then God doesn't grant it? Perhaps someone here this morning feels that way. And though you'd never say it out loud, you're tempted to think, but prayer doesn't work. Well, I'm considering this verse, let me say the following. Firstly, this is a real and assured peace. God does not lie. So we do not allow experience to be an authenticator of truth. Experience is not a valid test of truth. Truth is the measure of truth. And the Bible truthfully tells you there is peace to be had from God. Secondly, this is a pursued peace. The Bible doesn't say pray once and all will be well. It doesn't say pray twice or thrice or ten times. It does not give a number or a time frame. What it gives is a command. And the assurance that peace will come as you commit yourself to walk in it. It might only come after much wrestling, much battle, as the light of God's Word and the discipline of grace and praying gradually transforms our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. But God does not lie. The question is, will the Son of Man find faith on earth when He comes? Will men and women persevere in prayer? Thirdly, this is a supernatural peace. It's not conjured up by man, it's, it's God's gift and grace. And therefore, it is not dependent on the elimination of the cause of anxiety. It is a peace that can coexist with the trial. This is not God saying, 
I will remove the source of your anxiety. I will make the problem go away, unless we mean by that the, the, the heart's issue. But God is not saying, I will make your life issues disappear. No, this is God saying, I will grant my peace while you face it. And you've seen this before, haven't you, in the faces of other Christians? Dear Christian saints who endure affliction, and yet you can say with the deepest of conviction, I'm at peace. They might still be in pain. They might still have moments of tears, of course. They, they may often be confused in their darker moments. But their mind, their spirit is guarded supernaturally by the, by the peace of God. It is, as the verse tells us, a peace that transcends all understanding. It shouldn't be. It makes no sense, according to the wisdom of the world. They say, how can you Christians have such peace in the face of such hardship? How is it that you're not bouncing off a padded wall the the way the rest of Western civilization is going? How can you be so calm? And the answer is, yet not I, but Christ in me. I remember hearing a testimony out of the um, Rhodesian Bush War of a missionary and his wife who were, were surrounded at night by 15 men Uh, with rifles and bayonets attached, and these men came right up to this uh, woman, the the wife of the missionary, and she just climbed out of the bath, and she was wearing just a bathrobe. And he asked, you're scared, aren't you? Four times, you're scared, you're scared, these menacing men. And she replied, I'm not frightened. I'm trusting in the living God, not in guns like you are. Her husband on remembering that incident, wrote this, This was not my wife, but the mighty power of God in her. She was standing on the rock of God's Word. This was supernatural. Fourthly, though, this is a submissive peace. It's a peace that comes of submitting to the will of God. Verse 6, let your requests be made known to God. We don't go to Him with demands and instructions and conditions. And Lord, here is exactly how you can help me out. But we go with requests. And we say, nevertheless, not as I will, but as Thy will be done. There is peace in the acceptance of God's will for our lives. I suspect that the great, a great deal of the distress that some Christians feel is because they have not learned the discipline of submitting to the will of God in a particular trial. They want to be in control. They want guarantees. They want certainty. They want to know how and when and where and why, and not having those answers is what causes them to continue in a state of fear. And of course, it's, it's natural that we ask those questions. I ask those questions, don't you? But that's the problem. It is natural. Natural. According to our nature. And a great deal of the Christian life is putting off the old nature and putting on a new one. And the strength that God provides. A new nature, the new man renewed in Christ that with meekness seeks and trusts and submits to the will of God. A nature that takes up love that drives out fear, fullness of joy that comes from His presence, peace, patience, and so much more. It comes of yielding to God, of saying with Job, I know that you can do all things and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. I don't know about you, but I have found that every time that I have grown anxious about anything, anything, you take your pick, It is because I have lost sight of this simple lesson to submit wholly from the heart to the sovereign will of my Father in heaven. And I've tried to control my future instead. And I've tried to make certainty my idol. This is a submissive piece comes of submitting to God. And fifthly, it is a guarded peace, as we'll see in the the final, in the next point, uh, 
Christian, the world, the flesh, the devil will not rest. It will offer up many tantalizing fears for you to consider. It will suggest with seductive attraction many things to dwell on, return to, and obsess over. Night and day, offerings are plenty. So this peace must be guarded, tended, nurtured in the presence of Christ. If there are any habits that unsettle it, perhaps a lack of sleep or exercise, perhaps too many late nights or too much caffeine, perhaps watching too much depressing news or carelessness with your soul, especially in toying with some sin, then that needs to be dealt with, else you cannot expect the peace of God to endure. And of course, God makes people different. Yes, some are going to be more prone. Certain traits of personality are going to affect them. They're going to be more prone to to certain things. Uh, Some are going to bring anxiety on themselves also through spiritual neglect. Some uh, God has allowed uh, a measure of weakness to endure so that the sufficiency of His grace may be seen, not meaning He wants us to be anxious, that will be denied in the whole text, but meaning in His design. Some will have to be more diligent in guarding their hearts and minds in the strength that God provides in this area of anxiety, even as others have weaknesses in other areas. But whatever your makeup, understand this, The peace of God that transcends all understanding is real, assured, supernatural, to be pursued and guarded as you submit your requests and your will before the living God. And that brings us to the final point then in verses 8 and 9. Think this, practice that. These two verses are usually omitted when people quote Philippians 4. They miss the necessary follow-up, part of that guardedness that I was talking about. So, So they acknowledge God and His nearness, and they pray a lot, and they are thankful, truly thankful to God, and they try to be careful. But they do not guard their minds as they leave the place of prayer. They instead immediately revisit the same dark, morbid, fear-inducing thoughts that previously crept upon them. Or if not consciously revisiting them, they do not fight them when they come unbidden, as thoughts very often do. Unbidden, unwanted, intrusively invading the the consciousness. But look at verse 8. The Spirit of God, speaking through the Apostle of Christ, gives an eight times clarified instruction on what comes after you say amen. The command at the end of the verse is think, engage your mind, engage your powers of cognition. It means to reckon, to reason, or to consider something, to work it together to his logical conclusion. And then he tells you what you ought to think about. Now, someone says to me straight away, but that's, you don't understand, that's my problem. I think too much. Thinking is what gets me into this mess. Trying to figure a way out of my fears, present, future, or revisiting my past, searching the internet for diagnoses, and searching for some sort of peace. Thinking is what's driving me mad. <laughs> but the, Paul is not telling the Philippians to think about that. No, he tells us eight times to think about something else. Verse 8, whatever is true whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there's anything of excellence, if there's anything worthy of praise, think on that. And the word whatever does occur six times there. Paul is slowing down his readers. He wants us to consider each word, not whatever is true, honorable, just, pure, etc., etc. No, but really slow down. Whatever is true, Think about that. And what is true? God is true. Jesus is truth. His word is truth. That's truth. Interestingly, the word truth here is also sometimes translated as unconcealed. Think about what is unconcealed, what has been revealed. Don't think about what is hidden in the future. Don't think about what is concealed. That's not your business. Think about what is revealed in God's Word. Think about what is honorable. 
worthy of your thoughts, also sometimes translated weighty, having gravity, having eternal significance, the sort of things that God would have you think about in heaven itself. Think about that. And whatever is just, upright, as God is just and upright, God who can do no wrong, who will not mismanage your future. Whatever is pure, free from defilement, holy, sacred, as Christ is pure, and the things that He blesses and sanctifies, let your mind dwell on those things. Whatever is lovely, pleasing, delightful to look upon and remember, whatever is commendable, laudable, spoken of in a kindly spirit, the sort of things that you want to share with others and speak about with others for their encouragement and upliftment, think on that. And if there's anything of excellence or virtue worthy of praise or recognition, those are the things you focus your mind upon. Those are the things you return to, churn over, examine, prod at, ponder, speak about, research online, read about, and pray. There's where you put the emphasis. You, you, you don't think about that latest ghastly story that you heard about that crossed your path. You, you don't fantasize about disaster that robs you of joy, usefulness, and peace. Now you think on those things that God would have you think about. And again, this isn't merely reorientating our thoughts and the way the world tries to distract itself using techniques. No, th this is something that is coupled with the discipline of prayer and the light of Scripture as you read the Word. As you read the promises that are more precious than gold, even much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and the drippings of a honeycomb. Where God has declared to you in all His fullness, in all His goodness, in all His compassion, in all His mercy, in all His wisdom and sovereign love, compassionate, merciful, and glorious. There is more meat, more wisdom, more help, more practical power in these words than has been heard on the couches of 10,000 psychiatrists with all their vain, empty, godless, spiritless chatter. Think on this. Then verse 9, do something else too. Whatever you have learned and received and heard and seen, in Paul, in this instance, practice those things and the God of peace will be with you. In other words, look for godly examples. Look to men and women of faith and perseverance who have a nature just like yours and yet in the mysterious power of God were able to persevere in peace. They felt everything you felt. You are not unique in your struggles. Your brethren all over the world face the same types of trials, the same sickness, the same struggles, the same intrusive thoughts, the same fires of persecution, the same frightening enemies. They face them. They face them all. So look, look for examples of good conduct and learn from them. Don't, whatever you do, surround yourself with worthless counselors, unwise or ungodly people who offer unwise or ungodly counsel. I hear this happening so often. Wives that are frustrated with their husbands who then go and find worldly friends to fan the flames of discontent and, and, and only poison the marriage further. Or, or young men who are struggling with sin and that they look to others to justify their sin to them so that they feel company in the crowd. Or, or Christians who are anxious and depressed and then go and find worldly counselors who fill their head with worldly solutions, who have a form of godliness but deny its power. Don't do that. Don't learn and receive and hear from them. Learn and receive and hear from good examples. Godly men, godly women, godly children. Men, careless, neglectful men, read more.
peasants in previous generations would put modern men to shame with the level of their understanding of spiritual truth as they devoured the very limited resources they had available to them. Men, read more. Christian, read biographies. Read of godly examples of men and women. See your struggles echoed in their lives. Hear of their victories and the strength that Christ provides. Practice what they practiced in all their holy disciplines. Learn what others have learned in all their profitable studies. Don't be so foolish or arrogant to think you can figure it all out on your own, that you can stand by yourself. Lean on the examples of others. And then, verse 9, then the God of peace will be with you. When you practice the presence of God, when you make a rigorous pursuit of Him in prayer, when you are overflowing with thanksgiving, when you are guarding your thoughts most carefully and filling them with the light of truth, when you learn and receive and hear from holy men and holy women, the right sort of counselors, then, verse 9, the God of peace will be with you. And the hexing, vexing of the world, the flesh, and the devil will begin to lose its power. Do not doubt it, because God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of love and power and a sound mind. Will you pray with me? Our Father in heaven, I thank you for these words that are for Christians, for the children of God, for the blood-bought followers of Jesus Christ. Lord, we rejoice to know that we have such an avenue as the throne of grace and such a friend as the Lord Jesus Christ who is at our side. It is easy, O Father in heaven, to be strong in the company of others or in those mountaintop moments where truth seems so clear to us And we are so conscious of your nearness and surrounded by your people. It is harder when we are alone, when we are tired, when we are cut off momentarily from fellowship with others. And therefore, Lord, we appeal to the spirit of grace, of love, power, self-control of a sound mind that you would pour him out upon your people in increasing measure to strengthen and help your church for Jesus' sake. Amen.